So this is a conversation that I have in my mind. Are you crazy? What are you doing here in front of all these people? Why do you put yourself in such a difficult situation? Well, because I want to do something that I like. For what? I want to say something that I think it's important for everyone around here. You're not going to say anything new to your people. People, there's people out there that speak better than you. Why are you doing this that is so uncomfortable? What do you think I'm feeling right now? Fear. My voice is trembling. My heart is beating really fast. I can feel the blood all throughout my body. My mind is racing. It's hard to concentrate. I have thoughts about the terrible job that I'm going to do. How difficult this is. I've never done it. I'm not good at speaking. The mind is not wired to feel. The mind is wired to protect us, to be safe, to adapt. This feels amazing, don't you think? Our body is full of sensorial receptors, which means that we also can get hurt really hard. Two of my four grandparents are survival of the Holocaust. So they know what pain is, physical and emotional pain. I grew up with that message. You make sure that you are safe. You work hard. Feeling, feeling for what? That's not necessary. Make sure you're independent. You are a Jew. You never know who you can trust in this world. So I have four passports, Venezuelan, American, <laughs> French, <laughs> and Spanish. <laughs> Better than CIA, you know? <laughs> it's actually real. <laughs> yes. Come to a Shabbat dinner in my house, and you will understand it all. We have the best jokes. It's all about sarcasm in my family. We are super smart. We know about everything. We know about politics, economics, history, art, all of it. It's like we can rule the world. We do it so well. What's wrong with people out there? You come here, we come to the Shabbat dinner, and we're all like super tired. I'm so tired. I work so hard. But emotions, that's something that we don't talk about that much. No. When emojis came in, of, in texting, for me, was a problem. It was so easy to just text. Where are you? How are you? Are we meeting here? And now I had to express myself in text. <laughs> in, Think about how people take it so deliberately. A hundred hugs, hearts, smiles, sad faces. Is there any difference between sending one and a hundred or 10 or five? <laughs> it's pretty much, I don't know, but I had to learn and I did learn. My first boyfriend, he was unfaithful. He was dating this beautiful woman with big boobs, <laughs> an amazing ass. And you know what? You know what happened when I found out? I said, ah, please. I didn't like him that much. <laughs> Do you think I was going to struggle or be hurt? What? No, 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 no. But if you think about it, I should have been upset, sad, disappointed. That would be the healthy way of dealing with it. So I ended up building this protective mode, my defense mode. The defense mode of the brain to make sure that I was safe. And that safety comes as a result of what you care about a lot. In my case, it's people. I love people. I love to be surrounded by people. So my fear is loneliness. So every time I'm with people, I make sure people are comfortable with me. I don't like drama. I feel drama equals to losing people. So I'm the one that organizes the Shabbat dinner. If we go into a vacation or a restaurant, I can order for everyone so you are comfortable. And I have no expectations at all. So I don't need, I don't feel nothing. But watch me in sports. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I put all the passion there. I have expectations. I'm very competitive. I want to win. 
And when I have a team, I will tell you if you're doing the bad job, because <laughs> in my team, we don't lose. <laughs> you laugh, huh? <laughs> yeah. So easy to laugh when you, when you are here in my protective mode. <laughs> and what about yours? Do you have a protective mode? Is it easy for you to feel? I've been training for a triathlon for one year. You know why? Because it was a perfect way for me of avoiding this. Because I've really been wanting to talk. I have this passion about mental health. I feel that we live in a world, there's so much suffering already. And the mind makes it even worse. It throws you thoughts, the thoughts that I'm having right now. People are looking at me, what does that mean? Am I doing a good job? You know, those thoughts, are, they hurt. But we don't like to feel, no, no, no. So I'm here right now, it's been two awful weeks. I thought that I was pregnant. That's how bad I felt. <laughs> okay. The worst headaches, wanting to throw up. I actually lost weight and I'm not kidding because I'm here dealing with my vulnerability and it doesn't feel good, no. But you know what? I'm getting in touch with my passion, with what I wanna do, with what's important to me. Think about you, really, honestly. Is there any time or are you dealing with a situation that you are avoiding and avoiding and avoiding and avoiding? And the mind throws you ideas about why you're doing the right thing you should avoid, yes. <laughs> yeah, true. That happens every moment of our lives. Why? Because the brain is there to filter our experiences. Because again, the function of the brain is safety. Make sure that you are fine, that you're well. It's not well-being. It's not do the best for you. No, that's not the function of the brain. We go through life, filtering life according to that safety mode. So what I'm proposing right now, it's a different model of living life. We have our five senses, which is our way of interacting with the world. And then we have the brain. Yes, we need to be safe. That function is there for a reason. But it will be much interesting for us is we actually can use the brain as a sixth sense. Why? Because we need information about ourselves. We need information about inward information. And that's the brain. The brain tells us about our emotions. The brain tells us about what we like, we don't like, about our vulnerability, about our desires and about our passions. But we are not trained that way. It's very difficult for us. We are in that mode all the time of trying to make the best that we can. Now, if for us it is so difficult to connect with us, that part of ourselves, Imagine for our children, it's gonna be 10 times even more difficult for them. It's not going to be easy at all. And <laughs> look at that. Every time I see that picture, I freak out. I get goosebumps. And I see that and I say, wow, is that the way our children are gonna feel? My other grandma from Spain, she always tells me about these stories of grabbing her horse and running her horse from one town to another town, freely, no helmet, nothing. And it feels so amazing, it feels so free. And I say, wow, we will never live life that way. Never. Remember when we, when we get punished, when we were kids, remember? Coño, Mariam! <laughs> Otra vez tarde. You're late again. What's wrong with you? You needed to be here by 2 a.m. in the morning and it's 3. I've been waiting for you. No phones, of course. You know, and you're getting so nervous and feel guilty maybe a little bit sometimes, you know? <laughs> or upset that they're yelling at you, no? And then you have to go to your room. You have to deal with all of that. You know what our children do? This is the situation with my daughter. Gabriela! You need to treat well 
your sisters. Why are you being so disrespectful? She grabs her phone. <laughs> she looks at me. <laughs> it's like, it feels like, like they're, they're being unfaithful. <laughs> and she runs to her room. And she's not processing anything. No emotions at all. She's in her room, probably chatting with some friends, numbing everything, thinking that I'm like the worst parent ever, and then talking to their friends about it, and they're like, yes, she's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, a friend came to me, and she told me, my daughter, she's 10 years old, and in school, they're teaching her about the Holocaust. What do you think? Do you think it's right? And I tell her, well, so your children by that age, either they play Fortnite or video games that are aggressive, no? They watch movies that are PG-13, probably, no? Or even more. But we can't talk about the Holocaust. Oh, you wonder. Well, I mean, we're trying to protect them, no? Protect them from what? From reality? From what's real? So when they see that violence, they don't feel anything because they don't understand that violence equals you can get hurt. Something can happen to somebody. No? But we don't want them to fear. To fear. We don't want them to understand that, yes, we live in a world where there's danger and we need to do something about it. And violence is not right. What is the only way to show them that the violence is not right? Talking about it. Being honest with them. And that takes courage as parents. It's not easy for us to do that because it means to be uncomfortable and not knowing what to do with our children's emotions. And imagine if we don't know what to do with our emotions, are we going to know what to do with our children's emotions in those situations? But for real, for sure, we are not gaining anything by not talking. That for sure. Think about how distant they will be if we don't talk to them about it from reality. Body image. Social media, they're looking into that screen, this perfect body with a perfect face, with 200 filters there. They will never get there, never. You see how technology is distorting how we perceive the world, what's right, what's wrong, what's real, what's not real. What are the expectations that we need to have? This feeling, this perfectionism, that we will never be able to get there. Yes, and when we are in encountering a situation like that, I mean, talk about vulnerability. You feel inadequate for sure. Then the more inadequate you feel, you don't want to deal with the emotion. It makes you feel more vulnerable even. No? This is our fault. This is our parents' fault. It is our responsibility to talk to our children about all of this. My daughter, we were in a Machu Picchu in a trip, this beautiful, amazing place. Nature. Oh my God. And you know what I had to do? I had to put so much effort as a parent for her to engage because she was looking to take the best picture for Instagram. <laughs> She's like, mommy, are you gonna let me? Are you gonna let me take a picture? And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna let you to post a picture, yes, because the thing is, okay, you can post, but the purpose of posting cannot be that you are amazing or you are doing an amazing cool thing. It's been very tough for her to post, <laughs> if you, honestly. Find a purpose other than that and post. It's very hard for her to post. So let's look at social media. The research is very inconsistent. Why? Because what's happening is whether your child is truly affected by social media or not has to do with the filters that they already carry. So if your child has FOMO, fear of missing out, okay, what are they going to do? They're going to use social media as a filter. They're going to be posting with friends all the time. You know, like fakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the best plan ever. Mm -hmm, yeah, cool. That's going to be their posting for the most part. And you know what? Whenever they don't feel included, they're going to feel it too. So they have their phone all the time with them in their hands. So it's instant gratification 
abstinence. Instant gratification, abstinence. Instant gratification are the likes. So the anxiety gets relief. Oh, I'm included to the plans. Oh, okay, I'm fine. But when they see a picture that they're not included, anxiety comes out. Why do they have anxiety? Well, because they care. They want to be surrounded by people. They want to be included. For the most part, people that have more female traits, they're going to look into that. They're going to care about that. And they're, they're going to look and be in situations where they feel loved by other people. Now, let's say God posse. That concept for me was new. Preference online site interaction. OK? Look at this. High school student who has issues with social anxiety. It's the break. What do you think that child does now that cell phones are allowed in school? They take their phone, they go into the corner, and they start playing with the phone. They're not going to interact. That's too hard. That's too difficult. And they go home, and mom asks, so how was your day? Fine. It was fine, because they were numbing the whole time the anxiety. So then you as a parent didn't have a chance to talk to them. You as a parent don't understand what's wrong with them because they didn't have a chance to process, so then they don't have a chance to communicate what's, what's wrong with them. Then we have, for example, I love this one. You have this perfect picture, everybody in Disney World, with Mickey Mouse, you know. They look great, it's, they look so fresh, you know, this magical place, but we know all what happened before <laughs> and after the picture. <laughs> oh. <laughs> The kids, the, the children, they don't know that. So if you have a child that happens to be that they see that the neighbor has a greener grass, that child, whenever sees that picture, is going to believe that these people are having an amazing time. And what about me? I'm doing nothing. Here I am, stuck in my house. So we need to talk to them. Talking is amazing. It's a great tool to help them move on. So now you can see how the technology ends up being a filter, a filter for them that distance themselves from their vulnerability, the sixth sense, and also our, their senses. It's, it doesn't help them in wanting to connect with their reality. So if we go to gaming, I love this story that a friend of mine told me about her son. So in Fortnite, I'm sure most of you are aware of it, you start like a girl. And to build up that character, you either have to pay or you have to gain points, OK? People, children that for the most part carry a male type of um, traits, is, they're not like females. Males, they're more into feeling capable, feeling powerful, being in control. They're looking for that. And the game does that for them. So the children, they want to dress up like very strongly, you know, masculine and, you know, with the hair, you know, so that feel, they feel more powerful. And they start playing their games. And that's what, that's what it creates in them, that sensation of control and power while they're playing. It doesn't affect to all children, as social media doesn't. But I want you to look here so that you can understand and have an idea where to put your child. The risk factors for gaming are, for the most part in the literature, are three. We have impulsivity, conduct problems, and ADHD. The common factor of those three things is the child ha is having difficulties in adapting to their environment. That is the one thing that is common about the three of them, which means that they probably feel inadequate, they probably feel incapable, they're struggling, they feel frustrated. So once they are in Fortnite, that's it. They can do whatever they want, they can win. They can roll the world, they can feel powerful, they can feel capable. So why am I gonna go to soccer and play with my friends with the heat, you know, getting all sweat? No, putting a lot of effort to it if I feel amazing in Fortnite, yes? 
So, as you can see, for some children, after playing for two years, it can lead to some mental problems. Depression, anxiety, social phobia. So, those are like the ultimate filters. And if you think about that protective factor, is social engagement. We want our children to be engaged. And the first ones is us, parents. We are the first one to create that engagement with our children. Now, the ultimate filter for the brain is suicide. That's the ultimate filter. Suicide is the second leading cause of death of children. You believe that? You know what's the first one? Injuries, accidents. Self-injury is the second cause of death. So we've done an amazing job as doctors in the medical field, taking care of all those diseases that used to kill us before. But now, what are we doing with the mind? What's happening? We don't treat the mind as an organ. We treat the mind as ourself. We buy into that defensive mode. But it's not, it's an organ. So the whole idea of this conversations that I am having with you is to start seeing technology as a seven sense. The same way that we do with the brain. Don't allow technology to be a filter of your relationship with existence, the world, people around you, and yourself. Because that's what we're doing right now. We, and I say we because I am also learning about this. It's not easy for me either. We don't want that anymore. And it's very hard because it's so easy for the brain. For the brain, it feels amazing having that technology there. Being able to go back into that instant gratification and avoid a mode. The brain doesn't want to deal with fear, doesn't want to deal with vulnerability. So it's going to grasp technology to help. It's a perfect tool. If you see the literature, actually, um, likes, it's like being in the, in, like playing, like gambling. So the more likes you get, it turns into the dopaminergic system in the brain, which is related to the reward system and activates a decision-making process. Exactly like gambling. So the likes is like playing. So any, every time that you get a like, you get excited. Every time that you win, you get excited. And it's never enough. Never enough. So I developed this method to help myself, actually, and people around me. Help to try to find a way to not allow the automaticity of the brain to manage our life. So the name is Seik, not Sake. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, it will match, no? With me. It's Seik. S stands for spirituality, A, awareness, K, knowledge, and E, effort. Spirituality, it's so important. If you think about that defensive mode, why is there? Because the one thing that is real for all of us as a human beings is that we don't know what's gonna happen next. Uncertainty is there every day of our lives. We don't know when we're gonna die, how we're gonna die, if bad things will happen to us, I have no idea. So we need to help the brain. The brain will go into a path of pessimism. It's better to know, even though I don't like it, than to not know. That's the brain. So there are many ways. Some people use religion. For example, in Judaism, we believe that if God put you in that situation, it's because you can handle it. And that gives you a sense of, of safety, no? That it for sure is much better than pessimism. Mindfulness, Buddhism, they help you deal with the feeling of uncertainty and not be afraid of it and let it be and understand that it's part of life. And you don't have to mix it up with a feeling of threat. Other people have some sayings like, what it doesn't kill you make you stronger. With my daughter, every time she experiences pain, my three daughter, I'm like, c'est la vie, you know, there's gonna be pain. The body is imperfect, the mind is imperfect. You're gonna have that. That's part of life. And then awareness. 
Awareness is everything that we can do to attach to our mind, our vulnerability, our emotions, and our senses. There are many things that can be done. There, whatever you can think about. So for example, if you tell no to your child, no, you can't. That's an experience. Let that child experience that sensation of frustration or anger, whatever the case is. Or when your child has a difficult homework. Oh my God, in my house. I have to tell you something, I hate it, but you know what, let it be. I'm not helping you. That's life. You know how many difficult situations you're gonna have in your life? Many. And there are other things. I mean, you can work, be creative. Uh, you can do sports, engage in nature. And then knowledge. It's our responsibility to know. Know what? We need to know about ourselves, how our brain works. That's for sure, because if you really want to understand your child, you have to know about your own vulnerability. What is it that you don't like? What is it that hurts? What is it that you keep avoiding all the time? And then I really, you know how you wake up in the morning, some people in the bathroom, other people with their coffee, and you read the news. You know what? Take some moment, take time to read about mental health, to read about how to be a parent. It won't hurt you. Look at the numbers of suicide. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. I mean, that is like the best evidence that can show us how bad of a job we are doing in this society. Take a moment to read. Nothing will happen to you. And effort will be the last one. That's me. <laughs> that, that's my last triathlon, <laughs> running, you know? I, I run many miles this year. Many, many, I changed shoes, shoes one, twice, okay? but I want to run like that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, but I remember, you know, a client one time told me, you know, Miriam, I got it. Finally, I understand. You know, when you see people in such a simple life, it's because they work very hard for that. And yes, we have to work it hard. That's the best medicine. The brain is a muscle. The brain, we have to train it. When my clients come to my therapy, the first sessions, they go, um, can I go to the kitchen? I don't want the next client to see me, really. I'm embarrassed. They go like that. Because they're afraid of feeling that vulnerability. They feel something is wrong with that. That's our society. They feel something is wrong with us if you go to a psychologist. But think about this. I'm sure all of you have suffered either from a type of depression, even if it's mild or an anxiety, a phobia, panic disorder, and I'm gonna call this one a negative habit. <laughs> <laughs> or an addiction. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so that you don't feel so stigmatized. Yes, it's part of our life. In my ideal world, you know what I will love? You know this gym called Nine Rounds? I don't know if you've seen yes, it. Yes, yes. So they, you know, you go and, and you go first round, you have one exercise, two exercise, three exercise, four exercise, and all of that. I really will love if there will be nine rounds for your brain. I'm not kidding. So you have an issue and you go the first round. What is your problem? My kid is playing Fortnite too much. <laughs> Second one, what are you doing? What are you doing about it? Nothing. I get home and I'm so tired that I don't want to deal with it. Okay. Your third one, what's your defensive mode so that you can get it and understand your child's defensive mode? I don't even want to go there. You know, wouldn't it be amazing. And then 10, 15 minutes, you're out. That's it. You don't have to go into a depression, into an anxiety, into, any, you know, none of that. No need. The addiction, I don't know. We're going to be able to deal with that one. So the one thing that I can tell you that I struggle the most in a daily basis is to be a psychologist and a mother at the same time. I have my own expectations of myself. People around you feel that you're a psychologist, you should know. 
you know it all, no? As if we don't suffer and we don't have our own issues. It's hard when you see your children and you have to see them suffer and you have to see them go through life and know that it's not easy. And when it's not good for them that you have all the answers for them, it's actually bad. It's not good that we protect them. When we're protecting them, we're really protecting ourselves, not them. They need to have opportunities where they can truly connect with their reality, to be imperfect, to feel. So I tell myself all the time, when I go into my protective mode, as you, I already explained to you, which it happens a lot, so I have to remind myself all the time. I tell, you know what, I'm a human being first, and then I'm a psychologist. I hate when my husband tells me, don't treat me like a patient. <laughs> I hate it so much because he's probably right. I'm probably doing that, you know? So when you leave this place tonight, I don't want you to leave this place saying, um, so you know when you leave a talk and people around you, they go like, so how was it? What did she say? And you go, she talk about suicide. <laughs> No, <laughs> well, she talk, you know, she, she likes to do triathlons. <laughs> no, well, I don't want you to do that. Please don't do that. So I'm going to give you three things that I want you to remember from today's talk. First, the brain is a muscle. We have to train the brain like we train our body. For athletes, if they run, they have to train the whole thing, not only their, the, 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 the muscles, the lower part of, the, of their body, everything to get strong, to be able to deal with it and not get injured. The same is the brain. How? This, do the opposite. This is the second thing that I want you to remember. The opposite that technology does. So if technology is about instant gratification, work on delay gratification. If technology is dealing, you know, it doesn't help your child to really feel, then make sure that your child feels. If technology is preventing your child to be real and perceive things the way they are, be real yourself. If technology is not helping you to be vulnerable, then let's do it. Same with using our five senses. And the third one, find your own sake. Make sure you implement that every day. It's very simple, really. Find the things that can help you step out from that defensive mode. It's not that hard, I promise you. If you practice, it's not that hard. So I guess I can tell myself now, you see, Miriam, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so.